Hey there, joined by uh, former Alaska Senator Mike Gravel. And uh, I thought of you first because you are uh, so wise and profound on, on this never-ending military-industrial complex. So uh, it seems like uh, we've gone from zero to 60 in, in a matter of days uh, with the warmongering towards Iran. Uh, the president uh, today announced that he, there was going to be a strike, but then he suddenly had a heart. Uh, what, is your, what is your initial thoughts? Do you buy the explanation by President Trump? No, not at all. <clears throat> Actually, uh, this is John Bolton and Pompeo that have boxed him in into a position uh, where the likelihood of war is, is 80%. Yeah, and so all of a sudden, uh, he realizes that. And of course, he doesn't have great capacity in, in the, this entire area, but he realizes that the war is imminent. And so what he does is he downplays uh, the, uh, the shooting down of the drone. Uh, and of course, we all are suspect of the intelligence that tells us, or the military that tells us that, <clears throat> that uh, they were in international waters. Uh, a drone, in order to accomplish its mission of surveillance, obviously has to be over the enemy's territory. So it doesn't make any sense to make the argument, oh, no, no, we were, we were not spying on them. What the hell was it doing in the air to begin with? Uh, and, and so the tragedy is that, that uh, uh, Trump is not aware of really what's going on. <clears throat> he reacts to it. And, and in this case, his reaction was good. <clears throat> but what's wrong is that he's permitted this whole escalation to take place uh, and, and has caused it <clears throat> by withdrawing from the uh, treaty obligations uh, with Iran and uh, the other countries that were involved, and then unilaterally imposing uh, sanctions on them, even though they were, Iran was performing to the letter of the law. <clears throat> it's a sick situation. That's all I can think of. And, of course, it's sustained by the military, who are more than happy to move the fleet into position, more than happy to get the Air Force into position. And because what <clears throat> what that means for them is if there's a war, they will expend munitions, and, uh, and that will have to be replenished by the military-industrial complex. So if you want to see the, the real culprits in this undertaking, just follow the money. Who's going to profit <clears throat> from any from any uh, conflict with Iran? Uh, and of course, Iran uh, is is not Iraq. Iran, any anything we do with them is going to be a very very serious price, both paid for by the people of Iran and paid for by the people of the United States. So I'm not just talking in military engagement. I'm talking. The interests that are far beyond that. <clears throat> and when you say follow the money, I mean, obviously the media loves war. I mean, they get big ratings. It, and now it's free. I mean, it's, free. It's, it's free. It's cheap. Right. It's cheap, cheap programming is what they like. And I'm watching this and it's I mean, this isn't new, but you have CNN anchor, uh, reporters just saying, says the Pentagon. It's essentially just there's no reporting. It's just passing public relations off for uh, what John Bolton and Mike Pompeo are saying. Uh, like you said, there's no evidence that have been provided that this drone was shot down in international waters. It's likely it, it could have been just off of Iran's sovereign territory, and you'd expect a country to shoot down uh, a drone that they don't know what it is. But, but it, it was over their territory. The, that What's the purpose of the drone is to right. go do some spying without putting anybody at risk on the American side. Well, they called their bluff. Uh, same thing, where's the evidence uh, that all this tanker stuff that's been going on has, has been perpetrated by uh, Iran? It could just as well be perpetrated by Saudi Arabia uh, in order to kick up the price of oil, right? Uh, uh, and and so here again, uh, the, immediately something happens, 
you get an American official, Pompeo, the president, or Bolton saying, oh, this, this was Iran. They haven't, they, the, the, the sun hasn't even set on the altercation when they already conclude that this was Iran. And so this is part of the ginning up of the climate for war, which is not unlike what happened in ginning up the, client, uh, the, the climate for the Iraqi invasion. Uh, which went on for a year before the invasion took place. Mm -hmm. And can you kind of expand? You had mentioned that if we were to have a war with Iran, it would be far more, conf uh, uh, I don't want to say far more consequential, but larger impact uh, than even Iraq. Oh, very much so. First off, uh, we couldn't put boots on the ground uh, as we did in Iraq. Uh, that just is not a possibility the balance of the Arab community would not tolerate that. But uh, without the boots on the ground, we're talking about bombing, uh, that uh, obviously that's why we moved the bombers into position. We're talking about uh, aircraft carriers launching their, their fighter jets. Well, I'll tell you, uh, what, what would be the reaction if the Iranians were able to sink one of the aircraft carriers? <laughs> and that's entirely possible. They have some uh, some uh, cruise missiles that have that capacity, and uh, and there's new weaponry out there where <clears throat> where it, it travels at several times the speed of sound. Well, if that weaponry is out there, uh, it will be used against us. We've already manufactured it, of course, uh, and produced it, but uh, it'd be available to others. One of the things that was really evident in the Saddam Hussein invasion and the eight-year war with the Iran that Saddam Hussein eventually lost, but he's the one that instigated it at the behest of the United States. Uh, and, uh, and so what, what uh, Iran demonstrated is that they're prepared to take all kinds of pain for the leadership and the people you know, to engage in protecting themselves, the, the pride of, of dignity. Uh, and so what you would see would be an all out uh, release uh, on uh, Israel, which is behind it all, uh, and, uh, and also the United States where its forces are. So here again, you'd have a situation where the Iraqi, the uh, Iranians would be killing Americans. Oh, and that's so terrible. Of course, the Americans went over there to be killed. And that's the tragedy of our military leadership that, that just follows along with the crazies because uh, it, it satisfies the economic interest of, of the manufacturers of weapons of destruction. We are the ones that put more weaponry into the global arms bazaar than anybody else. And they're not even close to what we do in this regard. So if there's a warfare nation, a warmongering nation, uh, I have to say with great shame that it's the United States of America. Uh, and that need not be the case because pulling out of the treaty, that's one thing, but then turn around and establishing uh, sanctions on Iran which was obeying the treaty. I mean, where does that come from? That, that's outright insanity. And of course, the, the entire use of sanctions is illegal, mm -hmm. illegal in international law. And, and yet we, chart, we turn around like we're doing in Venezuela. It's costing the lives of thousands and thousands of children and women and civilians. Same thing in, uh, in what's going on in Iran. That's the reason why the military response of Iran is what we've created. We've, we've strengthened the hand of the crazies over there and, uh, and, and, they'll, and they'll retaliate. If, if we attack, it will be a terrible, terrible disaster for the Middle East, for the United States and for the world. And you mentioned Israel. Obviously, Netanyahu has been hollering about Iran for decades. What do you think uh, Israel's role in this? Do you think they're talking to Bolton and Pompeo and kind of pulling some strings? No question about it. No question about it. 
it, this whole this whole scenario has been Netanyahu's uh, dream, uh, and that is to, and of course uh, the hardliners have made the statement that, that, that they, they want to destroy Israel. There's no effort. There's no effort for them to to do that. It's just one of these crazy statements that many times are made by irrational leaders. But uh, but but I'll tell you, if the United States attacks uh, uh, Iran, the retaliation will be against uh, Israel. That's that's who started it. That's who's going to pay the price. And Israel has already done. Uh, some intelligence work against Iran. They assassinated uh, four of their uh, chemical engineers, nuclear engineers. This was done by Israel, by Mossad. When when you have a country that feels that it can do anything it wants in the world under the rubric that we, this is our defense mechanism, nobody's attacked Israel in a long time. And, uh, and and of course, if anybody were to attack, then of course they would fa face the full fury of the United States, since since they determine our foreign policy in this regard. So that's so. If there's a war that we trigger, the response will be against Israel, and response in unique ways against the American military. And do you think that response against Israel would be from Iran or the surrounding countries supporting Iran? Well, from Iran. Iran has the nuclear, not the nuclear, but the missile capability to to really wage conventional weaponry, uh, to send con conventional weaponry uh, to Israel. Now, what this could trigger with the crises in Israel, and they get their share of them, uh, would be a nuclear response. Mm -hmm. A nuclear response against Iran could well trigger a nuclear response in, res uh, in response by other countries against Israel and the United States. Th this whole insanity uh, of the warmongering fools uh, could well kill us all. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Joe Biden this week has been, uh, there's no other way to say it, kissing the behinds of Wall Street fat cats. You always mention um, the military industrial complex via Wall Street. So what would be uh, the, the Wall Street uh, benefit in all of this? They're invested, I assume, in Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and all the... Uh... Exactly right. No, well, the, uh, all of these defense contractors are in, are in Wall Street. They're, they're publicly traded. So, so in Wall Street, of course, not only controls... Uh, the the marketing of these uh, companies, but uh, it's beyond that. Uh, it's the control uh, to protect banking by the lobbying interest in Washington, uh, and then of course by the lobbying interest of the military industrial complex, which is just as powerful as the banking interest. And and then of course what you have is uh, the representatives. Uh, who are controlled lock, stock, and barrel by the Wall Street and the military industrial complex and also influenced by the, uh, the communication system, mainstream media. Now, mainstream media is playing this up like right now, like it's a normal crisis situation. Well, here, who, who started this crisis? This was started by Trump. And, and he thought he could muscle them around. Oh, all Trump wants to do is set up a photo op of himself and, uh, and the, uh, the head of Iran. Now, all of this danger for a photo op, I mean, he's a fool. He's a ridiculous fool that's putting the world at risk for an ego trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't get any blunter than that. And I'd like to ask you, because one of the fears I have with the president is, I think this is a man with no firm ideology, so if his internal polling numbers are showing him potentially losing those key states that he needs to win, I don't think it's out of the question that he would want a distraction. And one of those distractions could be a conflict with Iran. Your thoughts? Exactly. Exactly. The, the, in fact, it's an old saw in politics that if you've got any problem politically, start a war someplace.
But usually what you do is you start a small war where there's no consequences. But that's not what's going to happen here. There are going to be serious consequences on the American public because economically and physically. Uh, and, uh, and all of this because you've got a crazy like Bolton and a, a dunderhead like Pompeo that just don't send, don't has no have no moral grounding to realize what's at risk and 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 what's the cost of being at risk what's the what's the down what's the upside for them there's no upside for them other than uh, exercising power in an immoral fashion uh, it it really is very disturbing mentally uh, with respect to what's going on in the leadership of the country now here <clears throat> you got to you got to include congress in all of this because just making a few statements is and and we wound up at war is, is not an answer is not a role played by intelligent leaders and so uh, the congress is uh, is is if the war starts the congress will be complicit because they're the ones that appropriate the money and the authorization for the military industrial complex they're the ones that appropriate the money for the military capability uh, and for the uh, for the generals to make their statements uh, and and so it, it's business as usual with the crisis right well this crisis is far beyond uh, anything that we've had in recent years and also I mean I don't expect critical thinking skills from anyone in corporate media but why would Iran want to attack us? We've destroyed their economy. <laughs> this, this, of course, is, is what's played out in the American media, uh, and 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 it's fostered by the military-industrial complex. We are threatened. You know, we live in a the, the American public's been brought into a, a level of paranoia. Who the hell's going to attack us? We said they, we talk about China being an enemy. China is they're ten percent of what we spend on defense. Well, we like to say they're twenty percent or twenty five percent. That's not so. When you count all the dollars involved, China and and Russia is even less than that. So so here we make them the boogeyman. China and Russia are really a threat to us. Why would they be a threat to us? Uh, Russia wants to sell its oil and gas in Europe. China wants to sell its products in the United States and throughout the world. And Americans want to buy these Chinese products. And of course, you get uh, Bush, uh, Trump that started off his trade wars, which, which are injurious to everybody on the planet. And this is one guy getting to the presidency and thinking that he can go into, have we not learned anything from the smooth holly uh, trade wars uh, that we had at the beginning of the uh, the depression, which locked in the depression for a decade, the trade wars, and this is what we're facing right now. And that, and of course, you, what the media plays up the fact: well, there's great prosperity, the the, the, the people uh, employment is down, maybe three three and a half percent. Uh, we've got all kinds of prosperity. Sure, we got prosperity. What we've done is we've done away with all the regulations that protect the people from from a, the the efforts at climate change, and so sure you can you can gin up the economy, but it's it's like taking a hit of uh, of morphine. You gin it up for a period of time, and then all of a sudden you suffer the consequences of intoxication. And this is what we're doing to the economy right now, and Wall Street is complicit up to its eyeballs. And I'd like to ask you, with when it comes to Iran, you know, Joe Biden came out with a statement. I mean, I don't, I don't expect if, if Joe Biden were elected president that he's less of a warmonger. I mean, he's not Bolton, but the Democratic Party loves war too. Uh, so it seems to me Nancy Pelosi made a statement today that was kind of. Well, you know, it's good that the president is cautious, but we have to keep a, an eye on our adversaries. Uh, it seems to me to be kind of a bipartisan uh, desire for this. For this, no, no question, and and that's the tragedy of it. We the, and this has been the drugging by the mainstream media, and they've created an attitude that uh, Iran is a threat to us, 
Iran is a threat to the world. The same thing with North Korea, the same thing with Venezuela. Uh, we, and, and of course, we sanction all three of those as best we can to destroy their economies. That's what we've been doing. Sanctioning is making war. And it, it's, a, it's, about, it's, it's as safe as using your drones. But the, eventually, the world is going to wake up to this warmongering American imperialism that has been leading us and leading the world to these unbelievable threats that have gone on. And so here we are doing this. And keep in mind, uh, if, if, we, if, if we go ahead and go to war with Iran, you're going to see the eruption of war in, the, in South America. You're going to see the eruption of war in Asia, uh, in, uh, in Korea, and in Japan. The, 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 these things are all interlaced. <clears throat> Let me just tell you a little story about uh, when you look at China and all the criticism in American media is China is threatening everybody by all of these islands that they're dredging up in the South China Sea. Well, you know what those islands really are? They're, they're stationary, unsinkable, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 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 aircraft carriers. They're stationary, unsinkable aircraft carriers. So that the, because the, the, the most vital part of China's interest is in the China Sea, because that is where a third of the global uh, ac economic activity is transported through. And so if you wanted to damage China, all you got to do is disrupt their ability to travel through the China Sea. And so this is on their shores. And so we Americans think that we have the right to go over there and threaten them with our military vessels when they're, all they're seeking is a defensive, defense mechanism to keep the avenues of trade open, which, of course, they're so dependent upon. So is Japan. So is South Korea. Well, so, it's the same notion. I mean, NATO has all their miss missiles and rocket launchers pointed at Russia uh, on the border with Turkey and this and that. And then we say Russia is such a grave threat to us. Well, we're pointing all our weaponry at them. And, and we've, we've really lied to them. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, when we talk about Russia messing up in our elections, boy, I'll tell you, Americans have very sharp memories. When, when uh, uh, what's his name, the, preceded, the person who preceded Putin. Who was Yeltsin. Drunk. Yeltsin. When Yeltsin was running for re-election, we not only paid for the whole thing, we sent over consultants to operate the election on his behalf. And that's at the same time as the, uh, that the oligarchs were ripping off the treasure, uh, treasure of, the, of the Russian people and all became billionaires. Uh, when you become a billionaire in, in, in one year's time, you got to wonder how that happened. It happened through thuggery and thievery uh, under Yeltsin's uh, lead. And, of course, Yeltsin was in the back pocket of the CIA and the American government. Right. And, uh, I, go ahead. Go ahead. It's just a, I throw my hands up at, at how ridiculous this whole situation is. And the other thing that's ridiculous and, and it doesn't get talked about a lot. When you look at NBC News, when you look at ABC News, all of these outlets, CNN, they all have retired generals on that actually are working in or have, are on boards or have uh, private security. Uh, they, they work in private security to come on and say, you know, why we need to react. It, it, it's a blaring conflict of interest. They don't have Tulsi Gabbard going on, a, a war veteran. They don't have um, Code Pink. They certainly aren't inviting you and you're running for president. Uh, it, it's all the generals. Uh, you got James Clapper on there, John Brennan on there, uh, basically the CIA, the FBI, the military industrial complex. And it's just a 24 hour loop. And it seems like I actually think they have learned their lesson from Iraq, but they don't care because it's, it's a profit game. No question about it. And it's, it's very sad <clears throat> because when you say that mainstream media is controlled by Wall Street and the military industrial complex. Uh, people just look at that. The American public looks upon this situation 
and shrugs their shoulders. Why? They're impotent. There's no way you're going to change the situation by electing another group of politicians to public office. When you listen to the candidates talking, anybody that doesn't mention the presence of the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is Wall Street and the military industrial government, when they don't mention this at all, what they're saying, hey, boy, elect me, I'm going to be an empty shirt, and I'll be the puppet for the military industrial complex. That's the communications that they're making uh, to the complex, which of course is funding many, many of these uh, races. Uh, and, and so when, you, when an American citizen looks upon that and says, Jesus, what the hell can we do? There's nothing we can do. That's the reason why I have put forth a proposal that we need to create and operate a legislature of the people where the people can come in in a very deliberative fashion and make laws that would change here. You won't be able to get rid of the military industrial complex unless it's done by the people in a, uh, in a national uh, process, electoral process. You'll, the people will do it, but you can't do it through Congress because the, the complex has a stranglehold on most of the members of Congress. And, and the reason why I'm so admiring of Tulsi Gabbard is that she, she is on the Armed Services Committee. She's on the Foreign Relations Committee. She comes from a state that essentially has a very large military contingency. Uh, and she's got the courage to stand up and question, question the military industrial complex and advance the proposal that we should withdraw from all of our military bases uh, in the world. Uh, if that isn't courage, it, it, I don't know what is. And, but what will happen is I predict that she will rise in the firmament of these candidates because she's saying something serious and the people know it intuitively. They may not be able to do anything about it, but they know it intuitively. And what the people will do when empowered to make laws in, uh, in a deliberative fashion now you'll see some fundamental changes because the people will be more powerful than their representatives. Right now, representatives have a monopoly on lawmaking. All the people can do is vote on election day for a few seconds when they throw the switch and give their power away to their representatives who then hold a monopoly. And all you can do is beg protest for the next two, four, or six years to try to get them to vote the right thing. And this goes back not just to when people say, well, it's, it's a tough situation now. Hell no, this goes back to the framers of the Constitution who put slavery into the Constitution for infinity. It took a civil war to, to remove it, but then a, to give us a 90-year Jim Crowism and, and the racism we see today uh, that, that continues unabated uh, certainly more subtly, but it, but it's there. Well, speaking of racism, good segue. I wanted to ask you uh, this week, uh, I think, I mean, uh, the media is barely uh, pointing out that Joe Biden is literally, I mean, he, he's doing fundraisers with all the usual Wall Street uh, suspects. Robert Rubin was there. Roger Altman was there. He literally told these Wall Street people, uh, your standard of living will not change whatsoever if I am president, at least he's not hiding it. You know, Hillary Clinton had private speeches. Joe Biden is just doing it out in the open. He, he doesn't care. And it also came out that uh, he wrote letters to, uh, you know, segregationist uh, Senator James Easton. Uh, Easton. Easton. He, right. Uh, and in that letter, he was thanking him for helping him try to get his anti-busing vote to the finish line. So I'd like to ask you, I mean, you served uh, in the Senate, I think, around the same time as Joe Biden did. Exactly. I, I served uh, with Joe Biden during his entire term while I was there. And and I'll tell you, Joe is a nice guy, hail fellow, well met. Problem is, from an ideological point of view, he's a disaster. He's a disaster. Uh, when he talks about that, you know, he's, he's, he's with the working man. Well, he, when he was working with, with the working man, 
he changed the bankruptcy laws so that the working man got screwed and benefited the uh, credit card companies and the banks. That's Joe Biden. Secondly, when he was chairman of the uh, Judiciary Committee, he could have called two witnesses to corroborate Anita Hill. He chose not to do that. And he permitted, he sat there while Arlen Specter from Republican from uh, uh, Pennsylvania savaged savaged her like a, a mean prosecutor. That was Arlen Specter. And Joe was there presiding over that process. So, no, uh, Joe, Joe may sound good, but, uh, but he, he, you know, you, his, I'll tell you, one of the things that's going to benefit us is the fact that he's mistake prone. His flip flop on uh, the Hyde Amendment is one example. This Eastland deal is another example. He'll just keep marching on. And of course, there's a delay reaction into the polls where the media uh, reveals this. But keep in mind, uh, Joe would be the favorite of the military industrial complex. So he'll always have a favorable media, but, but there's enough within the media, the working media of conscience that will be reporting this stuff uh, and, and it will have an impact. So Joe is going to lose his legs here as he sprints into Iowa uh, because uh, the, now obviously my hope is, is that we elect a progressive like Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard. And, uh, and Warren, I, I, I'm impressed with all three of those people, uh, more so with Tulsi because she focuses on something that the, everybody's afraid of, and that is the military industrial complex. And I'd like to ask you, because it seems the media lately has been subtly propping up uh, Elizabeth Warren a little bit. Um, I think she's way better than Joe Biden. But, you know, there's been some things that uh, a lot of people in the progressive community don't like that she did not endorse uh, Bernie in 2016. She did vote for a $715 billion uh, defense budget. So there are some things. She, she's not where Tulsi and Bernie are. Um, what do you think as far as, you know, the media keeps dubbing her as the I have a plan candidate? Um, it seems that they're that, propping her up. Anybody but Bernie, it seems to be. That, that's about right. That's about anybody but Bernie and Tulsi. Right. Because uh, Tulsi is more of a threat to the military industrial complex than anybody on the scene. But, Ber but Bernie's great. What I hope we, uh, happens is that the Democratic Party, as a result of the Clinton leadership, has pulled the Democratic Party uh, to the right. And so when we say a person is a centrist like, uh, like Joe Biden, he's not a centrist. He's over there on the right. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is to pull the party over to the left. I'm not that strong on party uh, partyism itself. Uh, I think it's highly overrated as a device uh, to govern. Uh, it's it's as power hungry as any of the individuals who populate it. But but I think that what we need to do is to get a person like Bernie or Tulsi or even Warren uh, elected to public office. Uh, so that they can pull with their progressive attitudes uh, things to the left. Now, will they be able to enact their agenda? Uh, I think that the, I take that with a grain of salt, and I don't say that disrespectfully to them. But I think that we're, sh we're shy three votes uh, from the uh, uh, getting a 50-50 situation in the Senate. So that means for us to get control of the Senate we would have to get 13 flips. Mm. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and maybe 10, maybe seven. I don't know. Well, but, it, might, it might happen if some of these candidates that have no chance, like, uh, you know, John Hickenlooper, Beto O'Rourke, go run for the Senate. Uh, it seems like they're running for president more out of vanity than anything else. There's, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. But, but even under the best of circumstances, I doubt that uh, that we could get 13 or 14 flips uh, in the Senate. Well, if that's the case, then that means that Mitch McConnell would be able to thwart anything that's coming over with the threat of filibuster. And so he's demonstrated what he could do under Obama uh, and where, where there was no guts to begin with. Uh, but he could do that to whoever. 
And so that, of course, is what advances my solution, which is <clears throat> create a legislature of the people through a national election uh, that people would vote to be empowered and it would vote for a, a, a constitutional amendment and a Legislative Procedures Act that would permit them to make laws uh, in a, as, as, a, as individual lawmakers in a society. Let me repeat, the lawmaking laws are the heart, the core of civilization and the core of human governance. And whoever makes the laws really calls the shots. Who makes the laws? They have a monopoly, it's their representatives. And who controls the representatives? The people who put the money up to get them elected and to keep them in office. Right. That's right. the process that goes on. And the only way you're gonna break that process, if you now open it up and have the people come into the operation of government as lawmakers. And But then again, what you have is the, whenever I talk about empowering the people to make laws, I gotta tell you, 99% of the elected officials don't even understand what I'm talking about, nor do 99% or 100% of, uh, of mainstream media understand what I'm talking about. The, for, for all of them, they just don't think that the people are smart enough to, to self-govern. What they've got to do is a la uh, Madison and the others who made sure that the people would not have a hand in ratifying the Constitution or in, in, in objecting to slavery being included in the Constitution. We, we sort of gloss over that, that these are the heroes who created it. There's, there's no big deal about a Troika governing system that was done by Montesquieu 50 years before uh, Madison and the others were on the scene. Right. So, but, but what they did do, <clears throat> is in order to protect slavery, they denied the people a ratification role in the Constitution, and they denied the people to be able to make laws. Now, the people, can, the, the Constitution provides for lawmaking in Article One, provides for the executive in Article Two, and the judiciary in Article Three. And, and nowhere do we see the people, they talk about the people a lot, and of course they made this mistake, and that is that they, uh, they, they, uh, in the preamble to the Constitution, it says, we the people do ordain, which means that we the people are the creators of government. And, uh, and so we can act upon that. And, and the ability of the people to go ahead and empower themselves with, by making a constitutional amendment is clearly laid out in Article 7 of the Constitution, which is how we created our government. So the precedent is there. We just need enough people to become aware of this. And fortunately, I'll have a book coming out uh, in about three or four months. And, uh, and it essentially, uh, the title says it all, Human Governance, the Failure of Representative Government and a Solution to People. It's a de facto manual as to how to create and to how to operate a legislature of the people. And my last question, riddle me this. Uh, as far as I know, you, you will not be on the first debate stage, which I'm disappointed on. How is it that Bill de Blasio, uh, who has probably one supporter uh, in all of America uh, for presidency, John Hickenlooper, and all these people that I believe announced after you did, how is it that they reached the donation amount, which I have a very hard time believing, that they have the same amount of support as you do? No, they, they, what they do is they have a, a larger pool of political supporters. Uh, a governor you know, has a lot of people that contributed to his getting into office. I see. And so, and so while he's in office, he obviously, his, his conduct benefited a lot of people, legally and illegally, but mostly legally. Uh, and, uh, and so when that person leaves office, they know they have an entree to him so that they find it's worthwhile supporting him financially uh, and getting the necessary votes uh, and, uh, that it needs be. <clears throat> now, with respect to the polling here again, uh, they have a base in the state that they operate from uh, to uh, activate their a role in the polls. So no, I'm not terribly disturbed by, by that. <clears throat> here, 
I have not been involved in politics for the last uh, 15 years since I ran for president. And, uh, and right now, the only, the only campaign we have is a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old who are managing my campaign for president, and I refuse to travel. Uh, if, I get, uh, if I get in the debates, I'll go to the debate. That's the travel I'll do. But uh, my, my young uh, campaign uh, chairman, co-chairman, uh, they were asking me if I'd go to Iowa, and I said, no, I don't want to go to Iowa. <laughs> when am I going to go to Iowa? I'm 89 years old. That's what I told them when they asked me if I'd run. I said, do you realize how old I am? And they said, that's not what counts. What counts is your position on the issues, and most particularly your position on creating a legislature of the people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so with that, I said, fine, go ahead and file the papers. I'll give you my Twitter account, which I've never used. And, and they've been operating a wonderful campaign. And uh, though we missed getting on <clears throat> at this point, I think that we'll have a chance of getting on in the second debates. And we'll see what happens after that. And uh, was it you or them who came up with those fantastic bumper stickers to send Henry Kissinger to The Hague? Uh, they came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a conversation with them. It was about... The 9-11, you know, where people get all disturbed that uh, I've said it's an inside job. Of course it's an inside job. All you got to do is look at it closely and you realize that uh, it was a cover-up from the get-go. And the proof of that is that George Bush did not want to have a commission. Uh, it was He was forced into it by the widows uh, of the first responders uh, and the people that died in the 9-11. But what happened was that the, the, first, the first name that was proposed to head up the commission was Henry Kissinger. Oh, now, okay. if the, so if that doesn't give you a clue as to what was going on, and then, of course, they had two very nice uh, politicians that co-chaired uh, the commission, uh, and what they brought to the table is that they were famous because they were famous. <laughs> so they... And, and yet, when you stop, look at the report of the commission, the executive director was, uh, was, the, was an employee of uh, the uh, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, the, he was also uh, the, C, the, the person who wrote the report of the commission. Uh, so you can see the by. And the commission never even acknowledged the, the bringing down of Building 7 in a controlled demolition. Mm-hmm. And it also... The, all of the research that's been done about the controlled demolition of the two towers coming down in their own footprint, that's bizarre. Uh, and so that in itself, is that there's enough suspicion out there to warn a new commission, but not to have another political appointees in a commission, because all they would do is look at the issue and say, well, we've got to protect America's reputation in case we're involved. Mm-hmm. So they won't follow it. What we need is a, is a, a commission made up of scientists and physicists uh, and engineers and architects, uh, and also the three last uh, heads of the United Nations. So you're, he, are you saying Bush and Cheney knew it was coming and looked the other way, or they were involved well, with it? No, I'm not saying that. <clears throat> uh, clearly, the suspicion is there. So I don't have any direct proof myself. But I have enough suspicion and realization of, of how things are done within government and within the intelligence community since I was a member of that community when I was a kid. Uh, so, uh, so all I'm saying is we had three commissions study the assassination of Jack Kennedy. <laughs> if we only had one more commission, a serious commission, to look at uh, what took place uh, on 9-11, it, it would be eye-opening, but I don't have the knowledge. Specific. I read about a lot of it, and there's a lot of literature out on the subject of the, in this regard. So, what we need to do is to uh, is to have a commission, and, and it's really very suspicious that the mainstream media, when you bring up this subject, you're a conspiracy nut, and uh, and so anybody that talks about having a new commission. There's just something wrong with that person. You know, we've, we've studied it, we all know it, and that's the end of the story. Well, it was studied, and there's so many holes 
in the commission report that it's an embarrassment if you really focus on it. So why mainstream media plays a role in this, uh, covering it up, what's going on, I don't know. But I do know this, it's very suspicious. And when you have that kind of suspicion, there's a likelihood of an inside job. Thank you for taking the time, as always, uh, 89 years young. You're a lot, lot more energy and a lot wiser than a lot of the stiffs on our, on our cable news channels. So thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you in the upcoming debate. Let's hope. <laughs> okay. Take care, Senator. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed that last video. Hop on over to statuscoup.com where you can sign up for our email list and become a member for as low as 5 to $10 a month. Membership is how we grow. That's statuscoup.com slash join. And remember, join our email list so we can grow the revolution with you. Status Quo.